If you look back at my grandfather's generation, no one was just a lobsterman. They were diversified into any number of fisheries, be it ground fish, scallop, shrimp. Those are no longer options. These young kids are, they're in a pickle. You know, they're totally relying on lobster fishing um, if they want to work on the water. We've seen opposition to aquaculture really start to go down. People start to embrace it that used to object to it because they see it's a great opportunity. We don't add anything to the environment. We have no you know, fertilizers, no fresh water use, no chemicals of any kind, really. This is actually helping the environment by being here. This is the way of the future. There's, there's really no other avenue. Their ability to work on the water in a wild harvest setting may not continue, so farming of, of clams and oysters and things like that may be their only option. We're really fortunate on the coast of Maine to have a billion dollar lobster fishery that is a major economic driver. And at the same time, we're seeing how lobster stocks are migrating northeast as a result of warming waters. That has people, particularly in the southern parts of the state, already looking at alternative business opportunities, ways to diversify and stabilize their incomes. In shellfish aquaculture, and kelp aquaculture, businesses that are growing now to replace some of the value of the lobster fishery should we come to a point in time when it experiences major shifts because of climate change. I grew up in Dermascotta and the Bristol area. I grew up uh, learning how to, to lobster from my grandfather. I was a stern man, I was a lobsterman, I was a dock boy, and I ran my own lobster dock. So I've seen pretty much every aspect of the industry, which gives me some interesting perspective. I'm really interested in providing marine resource harvesters, or fishermen, with the tools that they need uh, to, to deal with a, a rapidly changing environment. Oftentimes, anthropologists are engaged in what we call participant observation. We do what the people we study do to learn more about it from the insider's perspective. And oftentimes, that's kind of a surficial thing. But if we're going to be encouraging fishermen to be looking into aquaculture, I wanted to learn more about that and find out what does this actually entail? Acquiring a lease site, starting up a kelp farm, with the intention of making everything about this farm completely transparent and open to the public. So it would serve as kind of an early adoption model for anyone interested in looking into kelp aquaculture. When we started our farms, we became the 29th country in the world to start farming seaweed. It's a $7.2 billion to the farmer industry uh, globally. There's a tremendous opportunity for farmers on the main coast to provide domestic alternatives to that Asian seaweed that's coming in. The farm that we were just on is a three acre farm and that farm can generate 90,000 pounds of seaweed a year. We put it in the water in the fall, we take it out in the spring, it goes in microscopic and it comes out, we have 90,000 pounds off of three acres. You know, the big concern over climate change and ocean acidification, one of the solutions is seaweed farming. It feeds by absorbing nitrogen, CO2, and phosphorus, three things that we have a little too much of in our bays along the coast of Maine. And so it acts as a bioremediator or a bioextractor. All winter long, it's absorbing those excess nutrients, and then in the spring, we take it out. It actually is really good for the environment. One of the reasons I started the farm, I think it was in 2000 or 2001, they were vacuuming the bottom for the settlement of lobsters and the counts were dismal, you know, there just wasn't a lot of settlement there. You know, I'd been fishing for a bunch of years and was building up my business and raising a family off of fishing lobster, and uh, so it kind of freaked me out. It was actually expensive for me to keep this farm going because I would have to take days off lobstering and work on the farm for zero money, but it, w it was worth it. The tipping point for me was getting my oyster bed big enough to sell to a wholesaler. Once a week, we'll throw them in the truck, jump on the ferry, meet him in Rockland, we throw them in his truck, and two weeks later, we get a check. And they don't bounce. It's pretty cool. <laughs> We started a, what, was, what we've been calling an uh, aquaculture training academy, a training course for fishermen interested in learning more about aquaculture. So we really covered everything from the basic biology, site selection, farm management. Meters, and you had them up to 20. Were they still 
together. The questions that they were asking were questions that research scientists may not even ask. It was really encouraging to see how engaged this group is. The most important advice that everyone received was, was pay attention and take good notes because you will make the same mistakes twice if you don't. It's not like Lobstern where my father-in-law took me out and helped me set my first traps and you know I could go to these old guys and they'd help you out. But here in Maine there wasn't any farmer so I learned by trial by error and that can be really expensive. You know I've lost a whole 90% of my crop from just doing the wrong thing. For future oyster growers you, you want to do some really good research and do a little pilot project wherever you decide to grow oysters uh, to make sure they're good and then you want to make sure they taste good. Mm. Oysters for breakfast. Nice. When we got into farming, I was amazed at how open other farmers are to helping out. There's no sense of competition. Uh, there's more demand than there is supply for main aquaculture products. So one of the great opportunities that we're looking at now is to site really new and innovative aquaculture projects to help those industries grow here on the coast of Maine. You know, if we're successful, these folks will have our support, but they're also going to have more colleagues along the coast that they can share their solutions with. I noticed that over the last couple of years, instead of getting a dozen or 14 or 15 green crabs within a tide, my son, he was getting a half a bucket of green crabs. There's roughly 5,000 clams under each planted gnat. We're trying to figure out how many you can do, how dense you can do them per square foot to get as much net value out of them as possible. We kept track of how many clams we planted. We'll keep track of how many clams we harvest at the end. And you know, if, if, if the mortality rate is too high, it may not be worth it. But Chris thinks it's gonna work out. <laughs> He's pretty sure. <laughs> You need three things for one of these farms, we figured out. You need fire in the belly to start out with. You have to have the ambition to do it. You have to have your own skin in the game. You have to have some money. You have to have time. You have to have your own personal investment in. And then you have to have a sense of delayed reward because you're not getting paid today for what you do today. The clams are at $210 a bushel to the digger right now. And it's clearly because there's just no product on the market. We're losing our dealers. This will put volume on the market and this will actually reach out to a different market as well a more specialized market because it's it's farming we may figure out that we don't need this many nets or we may need more nets we may figure out that it may take two guys to do each farm because one guy can't do it who knows but this is the start right here We raft grill all our mussels, so these rafts are floating at the surface. They're a big floating platform to hold our mussel lines, which the mussels actually grow on. So we do that to keep the mussels in the water column for their entire life. They're never exposed by the tides, and it also keeps them completely off the bottom. I think that the quality is pretty clear compared to, say, a wild product. It's much cleaner, um, no grit, and uh, much thinner shells, so you're getting more bang for your buck. The market is incredible. Um, we are constantly sold out, so we can't grow enough to fulfill the demand that, that we see for mussels. One of the reasons that mussel farming hasn't really taken off here is because there's a lot of overhead, a lot of things you need to do to get into the industry uh, before it starts to pay, and a lot of people are, can't really take that much time before they start to see a profit. Yeah, I mean, not all fishermen are going to be able to do it. It's definitely a different sort of mindset. It's more of like the 9 to 5 on the ocean world instead of the uh, boom and bust kind of thing. You're taking hunters and gatherers and changing them into farmers when you're making that transition, um, which can be scary. We're, we're all a little nervous right now because it's a lot of work to change, but and, and will change work. Everyone that I've spoken to saying understanding the business is the most important thing. The kelp will grow. You can understand how to work on the water with enough experience, but it's really the, the business acumen which is going to 
sink you or allow you to swim. Now it's, it's some paperwork. Then the DMR takes it from there and having, that'll give me an opportunity to go talk to the community. Um, starting those conversations early and often is really important for, for farm success. So I've got five kids. I've got um, three boys and two girls. The older one is fishing um, 400 traps and has a lobster license and he wants to make his life here on the island. He's got to do an aquaculture gig because you're either gonna, you're just going to go lobstering, which a lot of guys do, and, and they do great at it. But I think it's important to be diversified. This is for the next generation. It may not be for us right now, but the next generation is very important. It'll ensure this product to be here. Fishermen are going to want to keep working on the water. This allows them a way to invest in their future on the water. And I think that's huge in maintaining Maine's cultural identity, especially when it comes to coastal communities. It looks like it's going to be an inevitable move, so the more people are able to understand what it actually means for the state, the better.